Hoş geldiniz. Vitra ile Bilgi Mimar Tasarım Yüksek Lisans Programı 7 senedir birlikte Vitra ile Mimar Keşif Projesi'ni yürütmekte. 2006'dan bu yana Vitra ile Mimar Keşif Projesi kapsamında yüksek lisans öğrencileri 7 kenti ziyaret etti. Bugün burada bu Mimar Keşif gezilerinin birikimiyle oluşan liman kentleri Amsterdam, Barcelona, Hamburg kitabını tanımak için toplandık. Metropol ve Mimarlık serisinin üçüncü kitabı olan Liman Kentleri, Amsterdam, Barcelona, Hamburg, Bilgi Üniversitesi ve Vitra'nın ortak yayını olarak basıldı. Bu vesileyle bugün bizlere e, Hamburg Hafen City Üniversitesi öğretim üyesi Profesör Doktor Dirk Schubert, Liman Kentleri Dönüşüm Projeleri isimli bir seminer verecek. Öncesinde açılış konuşmasını yapmak üzere sözü Bilgi Üniversitesi Mimarlık Fakültesi Dekanımız Profesör Doktor İhsan Bilgin'e veriyor. Teşekkürler, sağ olun. Evet, e, sunuşu yapan öğrencimiz, asistanımız, pardon yanlış söyledim, öğrencimiz de en azından. Genel, niye orada olduğumuzu hatırlattı en azından. Onu benim tekrarlamama gerek yok ama, yani güzel bir vesileyle buradayız. Bütün katkısı olanlara ben çok çok öncelikle teşekkür ediyorum. Tabii ki yani ilk teşekkürü şimdi bugün için e, davetimize icabet eden ve bizi kırmayarak sadece bu konferans için ben Türkiye ile ilişkileri olan birisi ve e, ilk defa tanımıyor İstanbul'u ama sevgili dostum Profesör Dirk Schubert'e çok teşekkür ediyorum öncelikle. Kitaba da katkısı çok oldu. Bizim Hamburg keşfimize de katkısı çok oldu. Ama bugünkü katkısı hepsinden de tabii fazla hepimize bir sunuş yapıp kitabın girişi mahiyetinde yani kitabı okurken onun perspektifiyle okumamız çok faydalı olabilir. Çünkü kendisi karşılaştırmalı bir perspektifle bütün dünya limanlarını ve dünya limanlarının dönüşümünü izleyen bir akademisyen kendisini şu anda buna adamış durumda. Kariyeri bundan ibaret değil. Öncelikle kent tarihi, kent planlaması ve konut tarihi, barınma tarihi konularında yazdığı kitaplarla tanınmıştı akademik çevrelerde. Sonra tipik bir Hamburglu liman çocuğu olarak. Çünkü öyle bir şehirde yaşıyor ki. Yani biz bunu keşfettik. Ama hani Hamburg'u görmemiş konuklarımız için çok rahat şunu söyleyebilirim. Hamburg limanı olan bir şehir değil. Bir liman, bir şehri olan, Hamburg limanı bir şehri olan bir liman. Aslında devasa bir alan kaplıyor ve devasa bir üst üste yığılmış otopark gibi bütün dünyanın büyük gemileri dünyanın dört bir tarafından oraya gelip demirlemiş durumda, park etmiş dememek için böyle diyorum. Yani bir liman kentleri kitabının tanıtımında gemiye park etmiş diyeceğimize arabaya demirlemiş demek daha uygun düşecek çünkü. Şimdi bu, bugün vesilesiyle burada olduğumuz kitaptan da biraz kısaca bahsetmem gerekirse aslında bu üçüncü kitabımız daha önce Viyana ve Chicago'yu modern modernizmin öncü şehirleri olarak bir arada bir kitap haline getirmiştik Viyana ve Chicago'yu. Daha sonra dünyanın ilk metropoli olan Londra'yı bir bağımsız kitap yaptık. Ve bu üç şehri de zaten liman şehirleri olduğu için seçmiştik. Onları da tek bir kitaba dönüştürdük. Ve kitaptaki perspektifimiz bu üç şehirle sınırlı değil. Liman ne demektir? 
dünya ticareti ne demektir? Dünya ticareti bir şehri nasıl etkiler? Nasıl tarihti? Tarihi nasıl gelişmiştir? Ta orta çağdan bugüne kadar böyle bir perspektifle başladık ama burada kalmadık. Bir limanda, liman şehrinde ne tür binalar olur? Orta çağda ne tür binalar olmuştur? 19. yüzyılda ne tür binalar olmuştur? Ve Hamburg'u, Amsterdam'ın bina, binaları, limanlarının binaları arasında ne fark vardır? Kuzey'in yaramaz çocuğu Michel de Clerc'le Güney'in yaramaz çocuğu Antonio Gaudi arasında ne tür benzerlikler ve farklar vardır? Bu konuları da içererek kent mimarlık arasında sosyoloji tarihi arasında bir mekik dokumaya çalıştık. Kitaptaki makaleler ve çevirdiğimiz yazılarla göreceksiniz inşallah. Ben bu vesileyle bizim mimari tasarım programımızı destekleyen ve bu keşif programını birlikte yaptığımız Vitra'ya Vitra'nın içinde bulunduğu, bulunduğu gruba ve bütün yöneticilerine Vitra yöneticilerine öncelikle de bu ilişkinin liderliğini yapan ve benden sonra konuşacak olan Arzu Uludağ'a çok teşekkürler etmek istiyorum. Bir kere daha teşekkür etmek istiyorum. Tabii bir teşekkür borcum daha var kitap konu olunca. Ee, bizim Bilgi, İstanbul Bilgi Üniversitesi yayınlarının bütün çalışanlarına ve özellikle de direktörü dostumuz sevgili Fahri Aral'a özel bir teşekkür de buradan yollamak istiyorum. Öyle bir kitap üretiyoruz ki emin olun yani ürettiğimiz kitabın içerik kalitesi ayrı bir konu. Bunu zaten bütün akademik çevreler ve öğrencilerimiz ve eski öğrencilerimiz zaten takdir edeceklerdir ama yani kitabın daha fiziki kalitesi, baskı kalitesi bütün Avrupalı ve Amerikalı dostlarımızı kitapların çok cezbediyor ve daha da öte hatta kitaplarını Singapur yerine veya Çin yerine burada basmak istiyorlar yayın evinden dostlarımız. Bunu da söylemiş olayım ve yayın evine ve direktörü Fahri Aral'a da bu arada bizim bu keşif gezisinin ekibine diyeyim katmış olayım böylelikle katkılarıyla ve en son bir kere daha Dirk Schubert'e, Profesör Schubert'e teşekkür edeyim ve daha çok uzatmadan ve bütün bu şeyi yürüten bu süreci İstanbul Bilgi Üniversitesi adına yürüten ve kitabı ilk makalesini makalelerini Almanya'dan ve Amerika'dan oturan meslektaşlarımızdan tek tek toplamaktan kitabın son noktasını koymaya kadar büyük bir titizlikle yapan meslektaşlarım İdil Erkol, Alım Erdemir ve Elif Simge Fethahoğlu'na içten teşekkürlerimi bir kere profesyonelce çalışmaları yüzünden yani akademik bir çalışma ama bir profesyonel çalışma bu yani sadece bir üniversite içi çalışma değil. Böyle bir kitabın üretimi bir üniversitenin ötesinde bir performans gerektiriyor. Onlar da bunu hakkıyla değil fazlasıyla yaptılar. Hepsine tekrar teşekkür ediyorum ve sözü ben kendi adıma burada kapatıyorum. Şimdi demin sunulduğu gibi herhalde Arzu Uludağ'ı alacak. Müşteri İlişkileri Direktörü Arzu Uludağ Elazığ'ı Vitra adına konuşmak üzere sahneye davet ediyorum. 
Merhaba. Herkese iyi akşamlar. Sanırım en kıymetli konuşma benimki olduğu için en kısası benimki olacak. İhsan Bey'e çok teşekkür ederim. E, litre olarak biz Eczacıbaşı Yatı Ürünleri grubuna e, dahil bir markayız. Çatı Şemsiyemiz Eczacıbaşı hepimizin bildiği gibi. E, İhsan Bey'in bahsettiği gibi, Elif Hanım'ın bahsettiği gibi bu projeyi vitrail ile mimari keşifi yaklaşık 7 yıldır sürdürüyoruz. E, ben de herkesinin de hem İhsan Bey'e teşekkür edeyim bu işbirliğini başlatan karşılıklı taraflardan biri olarak. Aynı zamanda da bizi buluşturan Bağmur'u da aslında unutmamak lazım. Bağmur bugün aklına her yerde söylüyorum. Onunla başladı bu projede bizim bir araya gelmemiz. Ona da ben şahsen teşekkür etmek isterim. E, vitri olarak siz bizi ticari faaliyetlerimizde zaten çoğunuz en azından biliyorsunuz diye varsayıyoruz. Henüz mesleki hayatına geçmemiş olanlar bizi yakında bilecekler diye düşünüyoruz. E, biz varoluşumuzu sadece ticari faaliyetlerimizi çok iyi yapmakla ilişkilendirmiyoruz. Bunu uzun dönemli sürdürebilmek için de e, bunun yanına yeni değerler koymamız gerektiğini düşünüyoruz. Bu yüzden topluluğumuzun da açtığı yolla birlikte e, işbirliği içinde olduğumuz sosyal topluluklara yeni değerler katmak ya da onların değerlerini desteklememiz gerektiğine inanıyoruz. Bilgi Üniversitesi Mimarlık Programı'yla yaptığımız işbirliği aslında bu bakış açısının e, sonucu. E, bakıldığında da 7 yıl içerisinde e, 3 tane kitap ortaya çıkmış. 150'den fazla öğrenci bu programa dahil olarak e, mimari keşifte bulunabilmiş, bilinmişler ve e, o şekilleri keşfetmişler. Varsayıyoruz ki mesleki hayatlarına ya da akademik hayatlarına e, önemli katkılar yapıldı. Bunu ileride de devam ettirmek niyetindeyiz. Buraya gelen herkesin de e, bu konferanstan mümkün olduğunca çok faydalanmasını diliyoruz. Hepinize ben geldiğiniz için markalarımız adına teşekkür ediyorum. E, Dick Schubert de ayrıca bizimle burada olduğu için, zaman ayırdığı için e, Vitra ve Eczacıbaşı adına teşekkür etmek istiyorum. Sağ olun. Şimdi Profesör Doktor Dirk Schubert bizlere Amsterdam, Barcelona ve Hamburg kentlerindeki liman dönüşümlerinden başlayarak Avrupa'daki liman kenti dönüşümlerini, dönüşüm stratejilerini ve dönüşüm süreçlerini karşılaştırmalı olarak ele alacak. Dirk Schubert'i önce size kısaca bir tanıtmak istiyorum. Schubert, Hamburg Hafen City Üniversitesi kent planlama, karşılaştırmalı planlama tarihi ve kentsel yenileme departmanı öğretim üyesi. Araştırmalarında kent tarihi, planlama tarihi ve kentsel yenileme tarihi konularına yoğunlaşmakla beraber özellikle liman ve su kıyısı alanlarının dönüşümlerine odaklanmıştır. Schubert'in dönüşüm projeleri ile ilgili son yayınlanan kitapları sırasıyla Changes in Port and Waterfront Areas Worldwide, Yuvan Trok ile birlikte yazdıkları Growing Cities ve Residential Areas in Hamburg. So we start again with new batteries, dear colleagues, dear friends, dear students, dear Issa. It's a pleasure, a great honor to be here today in Istanbul at Bilgi University uh, to give a lecture on European waterfront and also Uh, to promote this fantastic new <laughs> book, um, which uh, will be presented afterwards. So yesterday um, evening, uh, I sat on the balcony of my hotel room and I read the introduction to the book uh, by Isan. And uh, Isan mentions in his introduction, when I came to Istanbul for the first time, Uh, I was not interested in the Hagia Sophia, I was not interested in the historic peninsula, I was only interested in the waterfront. Uh, that's only partly true, Isan. I did all these things first, but afterwards you showed me the waterfront of Istanbul and I became fascinated in these different types of waterfronts and when I revisited Uh, Istanbul several times, uh, I became a quite familiar view with all these projects along the waterfront and uh, in a way it's a quite uh, fascinating and unique waterfront. But in my lecture today I will discuss um, European uh, waterfronts, kind of a comparative perspective, but uh, it's not a topic only in Europe of course, it's a global topic and 
uh, these are just some postcards uh, from Baltimore, for example, or San Francisco, or from Boston. And uh, these images are, of course, very important because they demonstrate, in a way, the importance of the port and the transformation of these former uh, port areas. So, you know, it, it's, uh, in my perspective, one of the most important tasks for urban planners and for architects to redevelop these uh, next to the city center located districts for the future in a uh, sustainable perspective. Well, we have in nearly all of these port cities, seaport cities, a uh, kind of a similar cycle of transformation. So we visited yesterday the Tofana area and there had always been this kind of site, <coughs> forbidden, no go area, port facility, no access or access only for authorized person. So that was always the case. So there was no access to the waterfront. And these areas, some decades ago or some years ago, had the derelict areas, brownfields, no man's land. There were dangerous zones sometimes. And talking about the architectural appearance, in a way, facades of ugliness, one can say. And after this period, a uh, quite rapid transformation process very often uh, appeared. And this is, in a way, the cycle of transformation we can see. So in the beginning, there is a retreat of the port and a relocation because there's uh, not enough space for container handling. So we do locations very often deep water access for the new container terminals. And uh, for these older port areas, there is a period of neglect, afterwards blight and decline. Then kind of planning process starts very often with architectural competitions in the beginning. And afterwards, well, some of the projects were implemented and afterwards we get a kind of a revitalization of these areas. So in a way, this is a phase of crisis. This is a phase of hope. And in a way, this is a period of revitalization. But in a way, how can we classify these waterfront redevelopments or how can we make typologies so, for example, we can make uh, geographical uh, typologies to say, well, we got projects in China and Asia, for example, which are different from the projects in North America, which are different from the projects in Europe. Or we can take the size of the project. So how many hectares, for example, how many office buildings, how many residential units are involved? Or uh, we can have a look at different generations of waterfront redevelopment projects. So there's a big variety how we can classify these waterfront redevelopment projects. And of course, there's also a big variety of strategies how to deal with these waterfront transformations. And for my presentation today, I'll use this classification and I'll discuss uh, what I call office lab regeneration, housing lab regeneration, cultural lab regeneration, mixed use lab regeneration, event lab regeneration, and tourism lab regeneration. Of course, all of these strategies are always connected with local or regional problems, with the housing market, with the office market, for example. And it's always, of course, important to have a look at these problems as a, a starting point. And there are also other kind of opportunities, of course, when these areas are going to be redeveloped and when they are going to be revitalized. So in a way, the first example I'm going to start with is London. And uh, London, in a way, there was this problem with office space. There was not enough office space. The city of London was fully built up, and people were looking for new office space. So how to find new office space? And then there was this idea uh, to redevelop the Isle of Docks, the former port area, uh, with a new office district, also called 
the Manhattan of the 21st century. And the idea was, in a way, to compete with the old city of London, which is located here. And you can see, in, in a way, this is a kind of a dramatic theory, because the city of London is far behind, uh, uh, not very good to recognize it on this picture, but this is the centerpiece of the future development of London as a financial center of Europe or of the world, in a way. So this was the starting point um, in London, uh, uh, what I call office-led regeneration. And uh, well, these are some images how the transformation process was started. You can see these empty docks here. You can see some of the warehouses which survived, but then you can see um, this um, line uh, of the first subway here. Then afterwards, there was this big push and you can see it's only offices here. So a famous Canary Wharf Tower from Caesar Pony uh, um, in a way was uh, the beginning, and you can see early more properties and other uh, insurance companies, which also came here. You can see a very small residential building, public housing here, which was demolished later. But in a way, it was a huge project. So uh, the area included 22 square kilometers, including the Isle of Dogs and the Royal Dogs here on the eastern edge of the area, and even north of it here, a uh, large uh, area. So, of course, uh, to redevelop 22 kilometers of land and of docks and port areas uh, is a task uh, which takes a long time. And in London, for example, it took over uh, 30 years. So it was started in the 1970s, first Buckland plan, then the LDDC, the London Dockland Development Corporation was started, Canary Wharf was on the pipeline, and then there was a kind of a second wave in the 90s. And well, it's still going on. And um, all these waterfront redevelopment projects take a long time to be implemented. Well, and um, well, uh, in in this case uh, of uh, Canary Wharf, uh, the developer went bankrupt, and this was a big crash uh, for the project. So the future was quite uncertain, but uh, could go on afterwards. Uh, there was a kind of transformation, and uh, then more and more office buildings were built in this area. And here again, you can see the the phases of re. Structuring. This is the German subtitle. 1980s. Well, still docks, empty docks here. Then the first high-rise buildings in this area. Also, some new uh, company headquarters in this area. Then more high-rise buildings in the Isle of Docks uh, on the southern side also. And well, meanwhile, the project is more or less finished or more or less completed. And uh, in a way, what's important to say, it's a kind of a monostructure. It's more or less offices. Uh, it's not a mixed-use structure. And uh, in a way, this is, of course, also a problem. You can see, again, the structure here, the, the skyline of Canary Wharf, the tower of Canary Wharf is surrounded by other office towers here. It's just one tower uh, surrounded by other banks and insurance companies. Um, so uh, this gives you a, a quite good impression of the structure. Yes, there is a ship here, but the ship is not necessary uh, for any purpose. It's just there and you can have a drink on the ship, but otherwise there is another ship. Uh, otherwise it's only offices. So there is in a way no relation to the former port, the working port, which has been there before. So uh, radical transformation uh, in this area, in the Isle of Dogs area. And well, meanwhile, you're probably familiar with the project of the Olympics. The Olympics, in a way, is another extension of the Dockland redevelopment in the lower Lee Valley area, where the Olympic Stadium was built and the Olympic Village was built. And uh, uh, in a way, uh, 
in this area, there have been also many factories, and uh, these fac factories uh, were not in use anymore. So uh, an opportunity to redevelop the East End, and the East End was always the poorest part of London, and so uh, this opportunity was wrapped with the Olympics. But uh, in a way, these two images I show very dramatic in a way the cycle of transformation the working port in the 1950s and then these older people in front of the damaged houses here and with some existing uh, public housing which uh, survived. Well, London in a way is an example, uh, as I said, for office-led regeneration. Meanwhile, there's just a little bit of housing. There is also a shopping center. Public transport was improved, yes. But uh, another example for a housing-led regeneration is Amsterdam. And in Amsterdam, uh, there was this uh, problem uh, there was not enough housing, not enough affordable housing in the municipality of Amsterdam. So there was a big sprawl. People moved out of Amsterdam, paid taxes outside of the city of Amsterdam. And the city of Amsterdam wanted to come them back. So more housing projects in the municipality of Amsterdam were necessary. Yep. So uh, what I call housing-led regeneration, I think uh, Amsterdam is a quite good example. You can see this typical structure with piers here. Ships could be unloaded of both sides of the piers. Uh, we call them finger piers. They look like fingers, but uh, you, of course you cannot handle containers here. So there's not enough space for it. So the area, the piers uh, must be transformed and that was the case here and uh, Amsterdam again has this disadvantage it's connected with the northern sea by a canal and uh, all the ships must pass through locks here and the largest vessels cannot pass here so competing uh, with Rotterdam for example Rotterdam has more advantages than Amsterdam has but on the other hand of course this was an opportunity to re develop this area and this in a way was uh, the starting point you can see the structure of the piers here and then the first uh, housing project on um, this pier here then the project was carried on on this pier and here on another pier uh, and it's again it's uh, more or less a mono structure with housing housing a quite high density as you can see it here but there are, is only a kindergarten and a school integrated here small shopping center otherwise only housing and uh, the explanation for this quite high density in a way was uh, a slogan which was called blue is green so mm -hmm. you always have the view here to the river i and uh, in a way that compensates green spaces which are not included here or very small green spaces but you always have this kind of promenades along the waterfront here some more images uh, well very narrow houses but uh, what well, some people can have their boats in front here so uh, uh, kind of a copy of the medieval Amsterdam with all these narrow houses uh, you're probably familiar with uh, when you did the study trip uh, to Amsterdam you may have seen them and there's also a chapter on Amsterdam included in the book here are some more of these images uh, but of course this is middle class housing quite expensive and not public housing well again here you can see uh, another image another plan of this pier with these very small uh, parks which were integrated into the structure here but um, as I said before otherwise it's only housing uh, there is a variety of housing types here on the Borneo, on the Spodenburg, KNS Island, Java Island yes but again it's a monostructure of housing in this area and when we move uh, to the station to the central station of Amsterdam 
There is another uh, housing project called Vesta Dogs Island, which was uh, also built on artificial land, also with a high density in this area, but next to the station, walking distance to the station. And here is also some public housing integrated into the project. And when we move uh, to the Western Docklands, there is this quite uh, attractive uh, conversion of this old warehouse uh, converted uh, also to housing here uh, well, with a well, modern uh, colored uh, facade here and uh, well, um, quite interesting projects. Um, and um, here you can see this uh, are the eastern docklands, these are the western docklands and Meanwhile, several projects, housing projects, are started in this area, the former timber harbor, and you can see how it looked like. Okay. Yes. And uh, in in this area, there is also uh, a revitalization uh, a strategy. No, no, I, I don't need it. I need my paper. <laughs> and. Uh, uh, what um, uh, the city of Amsterdam wants to do here is to have uh, this uh, kind of houseboats again, which are quite popular in Amsterdam. You all have seen pictures of them. So um, this is the structure with piers here, and then there are docks, and along these docks there will be houseboats here. So of course also quite expensive to have a houseboat. Um, but meanwhile, uh, this project was also uh, implemented and now the uh, redevelopment process goes north of the river into this area where there had been many shipyards before. And of course, this land is polluted and it's quite complicated to redevelop. It's also landfill, so you need uh, very good foundations in this area. And uh, this was started about five years ago, and uh, here, in a way, they have a different development strategy. So, for example, you can see uh, one of the crane lines here, and this was converted to an office building here. And this is a big uh, shed here for shipbuilding, and it's used for the well, so-called creative classes here. They can rent space very cheap here in this area and uh, there's a variety of uses inside these buildings. So in a way, it's not only housing north of the river, there are also other uses integrated, like music companies and things like that. But very often, uh, these are temporary structures. So, um, well, uh, you wait for the development and uh, then maybe it will be converted again and converted. So for example, cafes from artists and uh, some student residences, but also uh, temporary housing, housing in, uh, you can see it here, in containers, also temporary housing, especially for students, a village uh, with housing for students in this area. And this will be, again, re-demolished in a period uh, when there will be other uses uh, found in this area. There are also uh, conversions, of course, of uh, older houses. And again, you can see it's mostly housing when you can see these older warehouses from the medieval ages or from the 18th century. And as I said before, there's a big demand for housing here in Amsterdam. And what they did meanwhile is also to have uh, new artificial islands in the sea. And the most um, spectacular one is Eiberg. And you can see this structure uh, with uh, streets, with public transport. It's located here uh, inside this lake. And it's all built on landfill. And uh, there's a variety of house types. Uh, some located next to the water, yes, but uh, uh, some more dense, but also uh, row houses in this area. And you can see the project, uh, which is more or less 50% uh, implemented. Meanwhile, here, how it was started with uh, 
public transport connections to the station in Amsterdam. Yeah. So. Well, the next uh, strategy for redevelopment uh, I want to discuss is what I call cultural lab. And of course, the most uh, famous uh, project in this area is uh, Bilbao with the Guggenheim Museum. And uh, in a way, the starting point for Bilbao was uh, the city had a very negative image. It was a dirty, uh, ugly seaport city, and nobody could imagine a museum and the impact of a museum here. But it was a big success in the end. You can see here, again, the relocation of the port. This was the starting <coughs> point of the port of Bilbao. And then it moved along the River Navion to the Biscayan Sea. And this is the latest container terminal. And here are also locations for ferries to Great Britain. But again, this area was derelict, suffused, and offered a chance for re development. Bilbao was a center for shipbuilding in Spain. Some more images with uh, all these uh, shipyards along the river here. But of course, it's too narrow and you cannot build large container vessels here in this area. So many of the shipyards went bankrupt. And then this idea of the Guggenheim Museum came up. You can see here the Guggenheim Museum <coughs> is already built, but next to it there is still uh, some container handling and the conversion process has just started in this area. There is also a new concert hall which is already built here, but uh, the transformation process here uh, has just begun and this is the vision, the idea, <coughs> having a promenade along the waterfront here uh, with a high-rise office tower. This is again the Guggenheim Museum and then with some residential buildings here with a park here. And uh, the Guggenheim Museum in a way was just the starting point for the transformation in this area. And uh, um, at that time in a way it was very speculative. Could a building like this change the image of the city, a cultural building, a museum uh, change the image of the city. But in a way, at the end, it was successful. Here are some images uh, during the night. And uh, Frank Geary's uh, project, uh, in a way, was a kind of a landmark and a starting point for changing the image of the bow. And of course, a uh, bridge uh, crossing the River Navion by Calatrava, Spanish architect, is also uh, included. And you can see the promenade along the river here, uh, which is more or less completed now. And here again, you can see uh, this uh, high-rise office tower, which is still under construction. You can see a residential area included in this area. So it's uh, also quite a, a radical uh, transformation from a former industrial area to a more sustainable mixed-use area in the end, but again using the Guggenheim Museum as a starting point here in uh, the transformation process. Here are some more images of uh, what they did with all these uh, polluted lands. So the decontamination, of course, was very costly to clean up the land and afterwards to have a, a conference center here, residential areas. And things like that and uh, you yeah, can always see the Guggenheim Museum on these images and you can see the promenade quite attractive here along the river. The river was also very uh, polluted and uh, well this is another image uh, also uh, which demonstrates how uh, the project of Abando Barra is the name with the Guggenheim Museum is integrated into the urban fabric as a new urban district with uh, houses, uh, with residential areas, with a shopping center, a concert hall, office tower, and last not least, uh, the famous Guggenheim Museum. Well, another example for redevelopment strategies is in a way a mixed-use strategy. And uh, this um, strategy in a way was chosen in Hamburg with the redevelopment project of Hafen City, and there is also a chapter by 
Ursula Bartel ist in the book on the Hafen City Redevelopment Project. And uh, in Hamburg, the problem in a way was the extension of the city center. There was not enough space for uh, shops, for offices, but also for housing. So uh, the project of Hafen City offered an opportunity to extend in a way the city center. And here you can see uh, an image with the old warehouse district and the first buildings which were uh, implemented, realized about 10 years ago. And then there is this uh, uh, museum, marina with some old ships and the next uh, district, the next neighborhood with this uh, residential area. Well, again, you can see this is the area of uh, Hafen city. This is the city center of Hamburg with the ring of fortifications. And you can see again the warehouse district and the typical finger piers here, uh, a map from 1905. And this area is uh, the area of the future Hafen city uh, redevelopment project. And uh, there was a master plan competition and this is uh, the winner and uh, it was um, won by the Netherlands architect Case Christiansen together with a team uh, from Hamburg and these are just some figures so it's an extension of the city center with about 100 hectares of land and in the future there will be about 5,500 apartments and well that means about 10,000 12,000 inhabitants and there will be probably about 40,000 new jobs in this area. There was a political decision for the projects in 1997 and it will be finished in about 2020 or 2025. Well, this is the first uh, prize from the master plan competition and of course this competition <coughs> has to be made to an official plan. This is the master plan of 2000 and the idea in a way was to have a quite flexible master plan that can be changed uh, always of course related uh, to the housing market and to the office market and uh, for many of these districts and neighborhoods here there have been more detailed plans afterwards. So this was um, another master plan uh, updated <coughs> in 2004 and what's important is to say that the warehouse district was excluded here. You can see it's not part of the Hafen City redevelopment anymore because there is another ownership here in this area. Uh, it's owned by the Hamburg Port Authority anyway. And uh, in Hamburg uh, there was a fantastic opportunity because in this area of the Hafen City here uh, about 95% of the land was owned by the city-state of Hamburg. So the city-state of Hamburg was able to control the development here in this area. And in a way this was the strategy to start in the west with this uh, pier you have seen uh, just before, then go ahead with this one, then go until this line here and then go further to the east and well end up here these are the bridges crossing the River Elbe in about 2020 or 2023. Well, nobody knows exactly when it will be finished. Um, but uh, what I said before, in a way, it's a mixed-use approach. Yeah. And mixed-use uh, on a horizontal level, but also on a vertical level. And you can see here these are uh, some German uh, subtitles. So this means housing. This means offices, this means leisure, this means shops. So for every district, there is a very detailed proposal how to deal with mixed use. So what's the percentage of housing? What's the percentage of offices, for example? And of course, uh, to implement a strategy like this, this is only possible when you own the land and when you can control it. And this uh, is uh, the case here in the Hafen City district and uh, uh, also uh, they want to have uh, different neighborhoods uh, with uh, different 
types of housing with different uh, types of residential areas, uh, which is also a proposal here with a park in these areas. So not have um, a similar structure of housing, but have a very diverse structure here in this area. And this is the update of the master plan here for the eastern part of the Hafen city district. Yeah, so um, uh, as I said before, the project will be probably implemented in 2025. Yeah, probably. And this is the line which shows what has been built yet. There is this area still missing. This is a shopping center. Well, this is in a way delayed because of the financial crisis. But otherwise, this area is more or less completed. And also some of the building in this area are also completed, so in a way it's uh, under construction, uh, but uh, so far more or less it's in time. Yeah, and I was I said before, in a way uh, it's an extension of the city center of about 40%. And this is of course a fantastic opportunity because normally you don't have this chance to extend the city center. Normally there are barriers and there are built up areas like here, but to extend the city center and to have a connection to the river Elbe again, of course this was the opportunity with the redevelopment of the Hafen city project. And um, we are now working in Hamburg uh, for the warehouse district, which is on one hand a barrier to the city center, but on the other hand, of course, also uh, the entrance gate to the warehouse district, that the warehouse district should be become world cultural heritage as well of this uh, office house districts with, with uh, office buildings from the 1920s, like the famous uh, Chile house, which is a uh, uh, listed building as well as all the buildings here in the warehouse district are listed building, but when they become World Cultural Heritage, of course, this is uh, much more uh, important and uh, impressive. So this is another uh, map which shows the warehouse district here, the kind of a barrier, and the office district. Well, the, the warehouse district uh, is under transformation also. Uh, it was used for storing goods. Uh, uh, until the Second World War, spices, tea, coffee, and things like that. Now, uh, well, carpet dealers moved in, and now uh, some of the warehouses are converted for office uses, and uh, uh, some galleries went inside. There is uh, a museum, meanwhile, and things like that. So it's also under uh, transformation, uh, this uh, area. But uh, probably the most uh, spectacular building is this one, you will probably know, the e Philharmonie. So the idea from the Swiss architects had to Demeron to have a concert hall on top of this old warehouse A, it's called in Hamburg. Uh, and this is also under construction, but uh, the construction process is stopped now for for about 10 months because the costs are increasing. Here are some more images uh, of the concert hall. So there is a public terrace here and the former warehouse will be only used for parking. There is some luxury residential included and there is a five star hotel included, two concert halls. But uh, there are very complicated construction uh, problems and the costs are increasing and increasing. And these are uh, some articles from a Hamburg newspaper, and you can see uh, in the beginning, well, the public subsidy would be about 60 or 80 million euro. Now we are uh, talking about 240 million euro, but this was a year ago. Meanwhile, we are at this point, we're by uh, <laughs> 500 million euro, and nobody will know what it costs in the end. So it's getting more and more expensive and uh, uh, the public opinion in a way is changing. So in, in the beginning everybody was supporting this idea as uh, a flagship project, as a landmark project. But meanwhile, well, there is another 
discussion so why can we not control uh, this increase of costs and uh, are politicians not able to do it and who's responsible for it? Is it the construction company or is it the architects or whatever? So yeah, uh, big discussion going on in Hamburg these days. Well, another example uh, for regeneration and in a way uh, for what you can call event-led uh, regeneration and I use uh, Barcelona in this case, uh, Barcelona, after the Franco dictatorship, uh, was uh, trying to, to reinvent the city image again and uh, to, to be a modern metropolis, always competing with the uh, capital Madrid, of course, but being more modern. And one of the reasons, of course, was that they won the bid for the Olympics in 19. Uh, 92 and in a way this was the uh, starting point uh, for um, a regeneration and for urban transformation especially along the waterfront and you can see some images here of these uh, derelict warehouses and sheds and uh, still the working port shifts uh, inside the port here an older image with uh, sailing vessels the famous ramblas along here but um, again um, the the olympics have been the starting point for the transformation and you can see uh, again in this area all these mm -hmm. sheds have all have been demolished this is meanwhile uh, an area for the ferries uh, uh, to mallorca for example and uh, then this idea using the Olympics as a reform strategy to become a modern metropolis was used starting with the old port here and then extending uh, the redevelopment along the waterfront into both uh, directions. So you can see this wall here, this uh, wall in a way uh, blocked the access from the city to the waterfront there were only some gates so as an inhabitant of the city of barcelona normally you couldn't get to the waterfront only when you're working in the port area you could get into these areas and uh, in a way this had to be uh, changed and uh, uh, with the public access of course everybody wanted to see uh, the mediterranean See and um, here you can see um, the Port Vale district, the starting point here uh, for the redevelopment. Here again, some sheds that had been demolished later, and here the high uh, density uh, residential districts of uh, Barceloneta. Well, the World Trade Center, meanwhile, was uh, constructed and uh, then this kind of a shopping center, kind of a festival market, were quite similar than um, projects in North America, where they also <laughs> had very often this type of festival market. And uh, then you can see here how uh, the Olympics were used as a um, reform strategy um, taking the projects, sometimes small projects, but with a large <coughs> impact to redevelop um, the waterfront here in Barcelona. <coughs> and um, here is an image of the, the beach, so polluted. <coughs> there were some huts here for fishermen, things like that. That has been changed dramatically. And you can see uh, two high-rise buildings which were constructed for the Olympic, then, then you can see the famous Cherda plan and with the uh, diagonal, the big road which was extended now. So you can say the Cherda plan was finished now uh, with the project of the Forum Exhibition Center here in this area. So this is the Forum project, also with the building by Herzog de Meron. And you can see. This is in a way the starting point for the diagonal which leads all the way through uh, Barcelona. And um, <coughs> again, 
uh, using uh, projects for transformation and in a way this made uh, Barcelona uh, to a kind of a mecca for planners and architects in the 1990s and after uh, 2000, how they dealt with this type of project always integrated into the urban structure and always looking for a greater impact um, although when it has been quite small projects and here again you can see uh, the cruise ships you can see the World Trade Center this kind of a festival market and uh, palms and trees uh, along the waterfront here so public access so very attractive to walk along the <coughs> ramblas and then get to the waterfront and use this passage here and uh, enjoy uh, the cafes and the bars along the waterfront and also the beach uh, is converted meanwhile you can see um, this is a picture I've taken three or four years ago in the summertime so it's uh, it's an urban beach and you can go uh, out of your office and have a swim in the Mediterranean Sea it's clean so it's possible and meanwhile of course also the Olympic village is converted uh, uh, for housing here in this case for uh, owner-occupied housing here. So uh, an example for uh, well what you can call um, um, event-led regeneration, the Olympics were the starting point for regeneration and transformation of the waterfront in Barcelona. Well, my final example for regeneration is uh, Genoa and uh, in a way, Genoa was not on the map for tourists uh, 20 years ago. Everybody wanted to go to Naples, to Rome, to Venice, but not to Genoa. It was uh, dangerous, it was uh, da um, noisy. Uh, so in a way, <coughs> uh, it was a very crowded city. Nobody wanted to go there. And uh, when you use some uh, old guidebooks for Italy, in some of these guidebooks, really, Genoa is not mentioned and you can see uh, some of the reasons why that was the case so for example this is uh, an elevated motorway and this is another street you can see six lanes here four lanes here then you got the railway so there is no access to the water and of course this is a very attractive uh, location here and this was also the starting point <coughs> for regeneration here and then uh, there was the, the year of uh, Columbus when we discovered um, America and then Genoa became a uh, European cultural uh, capital and these events were also used uh, uh, to <coughs> transform uh, the image of Genoa but with a strategy focusing on tourism and uh, you can see especially this area the port way here was the starting point for this transformation. Again, the port was relocated, the container terminals were relocated to Volcri, to the western edge of Genoa. There's a new airport built on artificial land here in this area. But when you relocate the container terminals, of course, you get the chance to transform an area like this and this was done afterwards and uh, in this case it was uh, especially Renzo Piano uh, and his architectural office responsible for uh, this perspective of redevelopment. This was the starting point, the, the cotton warehouses, a line a row here of cotton warehouses and then the aquarium was built then uh, there was a university located here, then the silos were converted, then there is a maritime museum here. And meanwhile, they are turning down the elevated highway so that there is a much better access here to the old city. And even residential, which was impossible uh, uh, two decades ago, even residential buildings have been built here in this area. So these are the cotton warehouses uh, which are converted to cinemas, restaurants, cafes with a marina in front of them here. This and is a maritime museum. 
the aquarium and you can see how they transform all these finger piers here even these silos here uh, meanwhile there is a hotel in this area and uh, the, again this implies in a way the relocation of the port facilities into this direction and you can see the the airport here um, also on this image so um, the marina here next to the cutter warehouses and uh, well some old trains which uh, survived and uh, well um, um, a, a strategy in a way which is very much uh, <coughs> focusing on tourists that more tourists should come to general that's of course means more hotels more attractive hotels and things like that and uh, here again some images with this old uh, sailing ship here uh, also uh, attractive for tourists and um, then of course it's necessary to have a good map for tourists and you can see that many of these uh, projects are located here in this area the, the, the oldest part of the port with uh, a lighthouse here in this district and then the transformation process goes ahead into this direction in the future well some uh, brief conclusions so when we review all these different redevelopment strategies so uh, what in a way are the real results what uh, can we make as a resume out of it so on one hand we can say uh, there are similar requirements for container handling all over the world and uh, if you look at these container terminals they all look the same if you take Vol3 and Genoa or if you take a container terminal in Rotterdam or in Marseille or in China they all look quite different so that's uh, of course uh, important when you <coughs> talk about container handling uh, you need these modern facilities but on the other hand you can say no two seaports are alike and no seaport of the world is like another there are big varieties and again the case of Barcelona, Gassenberg in Sweden, Yokohama in Japan and again the case of Boston, Hong Kong, again Boston and Oslo so a very diverse structure of seaport cities in a way all around the world so the, the reasons for this transformation process always start <coughs> with um, the development of ships and with the development of infrastructure and with the development of terminals and I use this uh, uh, Spanish uh, subtitle here just to demonstrate the size of the ships the gr growing size of the ships the keys necessary to handle the cargo getting bigger and bigger and also the container vessels getting bigger and bigger more cranes and larger cranes are uh, necessary to handle the cargo and on the other side on the land side you can see there well in 1900 there was this kind of finger pier which was okay then two hectares then the first container vessels four hectares larger container vessels and this development is going on well meanwhile there are container vessels under construction which can handle 18,000 boxes, 18,000 containers. And uh, you can imagine um, uh, how important it is to have enough land here to store, to load, and uh, to handle all these containers here. So when we discuss um, the case of uh, Istanbul now, uh, what was the starting point of this uh, lecture so what is Istanbul so is it a coastal town is it a hub so a hub means a concentration point of logistics uh, on a global level is it an urban port is it just a city port is it a gateway is it a general city and in this uh, sheet here Istanbul is called a 
so-called general city, which is also seaport, yes, but also with other functions. Is it a maritime city? Well, maybe. Is it a hubspot city? No, probably not. Well, here is mentioned Barcelona, Genoa, Valencia, uh, for example, Perios as hub port cities where the port functions are the most important functions in a way. So, um, of course, um, well, this is a kind of classification quite useful, but uh, you can always discuss it. So, for example, as I mentioned before in London, there are no port facilities anymore. So the port has been relocated to Tilbury. But uh, anyway, so quite useful uh, to, to discuss the importance of uh, port and port uh, terminals and port facilities in general in the context of the city development. So you are all familiar probably with this image. So when you see this image, of course, you would say, well, Istanbul, no, it's not a seaport city, no. And if you see this image, of course, you are, you are impressed by this uh, dynamic of ferry boats and smaller boats and uh, uh, all these uh, uh, variety of ships and vessels along uh, the, the Golden Horn area here in this case. And Again, this is a kind of a mixture. So I think uh, this sheet before is quite useful because on one hand, yes, of course, you have the historic peninsula. Yes, you have all these fascinating mosques and uh, the big bazaar and so on and so on. But in the background, you also have these office towers. Uh, so uh, the, the mega city office uh, development also. Uh, but. Um, what to do with Istanbul in the future. So uh, when, when you talk about the uniqueness uh, of Istanbul, I think uh, one important issue is really that it has a long history and it has always been a seaport. So seaports, in a way, are places in which local and exotic, foreign and familiar poverty and riches, tradition and modernization meet. And you probably all are familiar with these uh, movies like uh, On the Waterfront with Marlon Brando or with these uh, pop songs sitting on the dock of the bay. And these two images uh, demonstrate what happened at the waterfront. So hard work, dangerous work 50 years ago in a way, and these modern container centers. So in seaport cities always, it's a kind of culmination of innovations in economy, society and culture. They are command centers for the global economy and also forerunners of globalization. But they also are places where we always have uh, movies in mind. We all know about novels, for example, songs and things like that. Uh, all related uh, to uh, the seaport and to the waterfront. And in a way, the question is, why do we love this? Why do we, we have this kind of uh, scenery in mind? And what, what makes the difference in a way to other cities which are not seaport cities? And uh, these are some images which uh, demonstrate the port culture, the port history uh, for Hamburg, for example, so the famous red light district, uh, famous singer making uh, songs about uh, uh, being a sailor or uh, dynamic ship and the, in the background the famous Schiele House office building and well, somebody playing songs about the waterfront. So, well, this is of course on one hand, this is a past, yeah, but we must look very carefully what can be taken out of this past for the future. And well, we have this kind of a spatial separation of physical port functions related to deep water access, and they are in a way centers of command and control. And when we need explanations for these transformation processes, uh, for the local built environment. We, the transformation of former port areas and waterfront 
We must include always global decision-making processes from the so-called global players. So may they make the decisions, and they make the decisions maybe in Singapore, in Hong Kong, or on the Cayman Islands, but they have heavy impacts, for example, in Istanbul, or in Hamburg, or wherever. So what will happen in the future? So in a way, you all probably as architectural students know the Swiss rebuilding from London. Um, you probably know the tower from uh, Shanghai, from Pudong. You know La Défense in Paris. So in a way, <coughs> what's unique? And uh, when we talk about uh, the redevelopment of waterfront, I think there are some trends uh, to copy things. And this, in a way, means very often kitsch and shabby design. And so I think it's very important to avoid this kind of sameness. So in North America, it's called S-H-E, which means seaport, seaport history and entertainment. So this should be a successful cluster. So avoid history as theme parks, Disneyfication, nostalgic mm -hmm. images of the past, and mono structures. And I think what you can do, what's important, is try to develop uniqueness. So in marketing, it's called USP, to develop a unique selling position. <coughs> and history really matters. Seaports have a specific urban port culture. And it's important to develop this authenticity local identity and to use a proactive approach, um, a plan-led approach for redevelopment. So uh, at the end, when, when you ask uh, what would be my message for Istanbul, so my message is very simple. Use the latecomer advantage. So Istanbul has a lot of opportunities along the waterfront. You can learn uh, from other cities, from other seaport cities, but don't copy uh, these uh, projects uh, I mentioned in my lecture. So make the best of it, learning from other examples, but don't copy. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>
Uh, but in a way, uh, the most important problem probably is how to make this decision process. So, uh, what kind of stakeholders are involved? So probably the national government in Ankara is involved, maybe the Navy is involved, the municipality of Istanbul is involved, maybe uh, a borough, I don't know the name of the borough over there, is involved, then there are many shipping companies involved, and so on and so on. And in a way, these shipping companies, they make their decisions top down. So they make their decision in Singapore or in Shanghai, and they are not interested in local conditions here in Istanbul, for example. And they are not interested in any impacts here in Istanbul. But of course, there are very heavy impacts here if there is a decision to close the container terminal in Haida Pasha or to relocate the container terminal. So, yeah, um, it's a quite complicated decision making process. And if it's possible to, to have it uh, also as a bottom up uh, decision making process, of course, this could be very useful. But uh, well, on the other hand, um, there are not many jobs included. So it's a, uh, unloading containers. Meanwhile, it's a high tech job. You know, you do it by computer more or less, and uh, it's not that kind of uh, a job um, promoter which it was well 50 years ago. So at that time, of course, it was hard work, and there were many doctors. Um, involved in unloading the ship and uh, it was casual labor and many people relied on this. So this has changed totally. So yeah, I, I just can make this kind of comment. So m maybe uh, relocation could be useful, but then it must be discussed on a regional level, not on the level of the municipality of Istanbul. Yeah.